Good morning. <laughs> oh, I just said to Jeff, I can barely stand. <sighs> mm. Sometimes you feel like you could just have a little sleep, <laughs> just in the presence of God. <laughs> then you realize you've got to bring a word. <sighs> oh, sure, we'll get to it. <laughs> Ooh, pretty shaky actually. Isn't it? <laughs> oh. oh, I feel the stage has been set so perfectly again. I just feel so, um, so very blessed to be just part of a, a church family, a community where, you know, we have this kind of place to come to, and just even even. Um, you know, when we're just out and about in our everyday lives, we, we have a network to be connected to. And through the various groups we're part of, whatever they may be, we can always just get contact to those groups and just feel connected and just be strengthened. Even if we're just on our own in our day, we can plug in and then feel tangibly the prayer, the support that's what I feel, anyway, of, of this church in particular. And I think God is really looking to do that with his people all over the country, all over the world in a new way, in a, in a deeper way. All today has been about reflecting on his goodness, his faithfulness, but then the current necessity to keep surrendering, to keep laying ourselves before him. And the simplicity of just being before him. And, you know, like the song about the hallelujah, all that I have is a hallelujah. But so often that can be the hardest to bring sometimes just to, to come and say, I'm here all for you, Lord. But that's all he requires because then he can come to work in you. He won't force his hand beyond your free will, but a surrendered heart is what he's looking for. And anybody, whomsoever, at any time can do that. And that's the beauty of what he offers through Jesus Christ, the invitation to all, no matter what. And I find myself coming back to that message quite a lot just to say that, because it's so important, because the enemy the devil, or even just your own self sometimes would try and talk you out of that place to say there's things you need to do. You need to be good enough and clean enough before you come. But you need to come in order to get clean <laughs> and to get strengthened. And then it's his goodness and his righteousness that is clothed upon you like the royal robes about which we sang today. Yeah, <laughs> I, um, I feel it's so important that we hold on to the words that God is giving us. We've got his word, and that is timeless. Because Proverbs 25 says that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search out that matter. <laughs> You know, God conceals things. You know, this, this is words on a page. But you need the Holy Spirit, really, to read this book so that these words just kind of open up like, like boxes of mystery just coming clear for you. And you can read a scripture, but then at different points in your life, I find those same words can mean different things. They can speak to you in different ways because God has concealed things, not to restrict you or hide it from you in a malicious way, but in the way that one preacher put it once, it's a bit like the Easter egg hunt. You hide the eggs for the children, not in a diabolical, sinister way that we could just hide them so they would never be found. You hide them in an obvious way, but a way that so excites the children that they've found an egg. But they have to go on that little hunt. They have to put in some effort. 
And sometimes if they're not seeing the one that's right next to them, like children have that way of doing, you sort of like, oh, I wonder if there's something there. And then they go, ah, there's an egg. And they're so excited that they've found that egg. That's what God does, really, with us. We might not always like the concept of that sometimes because it sort of insults our intelligence. But as intelligent as we are, we're just children sort of ambling around the place. But we have a loving father who's put those eggs, those nuggets for us. And we go on a journey, and sometimes he nudges us towards an egg that he's put there. He's concealed it for a time, and then a time comes. That's his word. So as we get into his word, we position ourselves to find those eggs. But then through our church in particular over this this last year, we've had particular prophetic words when God speaks in, in in a different kind of way to a particular group of people. Now, it may be the case that I think the the words we've heard about the changing of the landscape, that God is is reshaping a landscape, that that's, well, multiple aspects to that, but two main ways is that he's changing our hearts. He's looking to reshape and rework our hearts, but then also collectively as a community, when every believer is kind of like switched on to him that creates that synergy that creates that family of everyone being in the right place connected to each other all positioned strategically whatever that may look like it might not look particularly like wow factor to the world but if God's put you in a place you might feel like you're stuffed in a corner behind a curtain somewhere But if that's where God's got you, whatever it's doing, there's purpose in that. And that purpose is just as significant as me standing here now doing this. You know, God stuffs me in plenty of corners just behind the scenes in my everyday life sometimes or seasons that have gone by. But you can know there's purpose in it. You can feel that peace of God and be like, yes, I know you're in this, so I will do it because I know it's of relevance and it's important. And, you know, in order to rework a landscape, you know, Paul Williams was preaching to us a while back and he showed us some pictures of his back garden when they were having it, like, renovated and reworked. And, you know, it went from looking as it was and then it was an absolute wreck, an absolute building site, just the grass turfed up, you maybe got slabs or stones you want to lay all piled up, there's dirt and muck everywhere, there's maybe little mini diggers around the place and it just looks like chaos. But then you see the, ta-da, the finished picture. You don't see like necessarily us every step of the way, more people like go, oh this is what it was and here it is now. It's like a homes under the hammer thing, there's some like dilapidated wreck and then they go, shazam, there we go. And you go, oh, isn't that lovely? But graft and hard work has gone into that. Time has gone into that. We so often want to jump the gun on God's timing. We want that finished, beautiful picture, the house, the garden, that's all lovely. But God's into the renovation process. And, you know, I would say, and you might well witness with it, but that renovation process, you can learn some of the deepest stuff about yourself and about God. So yes, he wants to get you to a place, but that journey is so, so formative, I would think anyway. That's my experience. So this word about the changing of the landscape starts with our hearts, and then collectively together, this whole church, this family will start to be reshaped in new, exciting ways. God will keep the foundations he's already placed, but then he'll build on those, he'll strengthen those, he'll rework those. He'll do new, beautiful, marvellous things that we may have never seen before. Just like the layers of his word. You know, the word doesn't change, but the meaning and application, God can strip back layers that he's hidden 
and concealed. And I think entire scriptures that we've read many, many times will we'll have new insights into them. It's very important we don't change the word, and you have to be very careful. I'm very careful when I preach this kind of word, and I would say, hear me in the right way. I'm not talking about changing his word. I'm talking about allowing the Holy Spirit to bring revelation that he has concealed in this word for a time and a season because life is so much about seasons. And I believe, as I've said a, a number of times, particularly in recent years, that we're very much in the end time season. I, I see so much going on that really brings a lot of scriptures to life, a lot that Jesus talks about the end times, a lot of things that Revelation talks about. We're, we're closer to things than ever before, I feel. There's things happening now that could not have happened even 10 or 20 years ago. And some of the stuff on the horizon, good and bad, again, if you get into your scripture, you can maybe start to see God saying, this bit here that might not have made much sense 10 years ago, there's new things I want you to grasp out of this. That's what God wants us, the spiritually aware, the insightful church. Peter, as he was praying just before down there, as he was just uh, quoting the scriptures from Isaiah, he also said about seeing beyond the natural into the spiritual. And we see that so much in the scripture and the importance of it in our own life. In the context of the changing seasons and the landscape of our heart changing, I wanted to bring a word that was given to me well over 10 years ago. Now, it must be well over 10 years ago. And Paul Williams actually brought it as part of one of the messages he had, like, many years ago. Because um, they used to do a home group way back in the day, and I was part of that. And this was, like, really early days. This was before I, I preached regularly, um, I was very new to the Lord, and it was all, he was just doing a lot of stuff, but I was still a big mess, <laughs> and I was just very excited about what was going on. And God spoke to me, he showed me a picture, he often speaks in kind of pictures, a bit like a series of comic strip pictures, or like a film playing out, and he showed me a picture that involved a big wave, like a tsunami style wave, and um, I shared it just in the little home group we had, and then Paul felt like it witnessed with him in some way, and he, he said, can I share it? And he did. He shared it as part of his message, and that was that. And it had relevance and application at the time, and that was that. You know, a decade or so has passed. But then in recent months, it's come back to my attention I think Paul's wife, Merle, was mentioning it to Ant. Ant often comes up here and gives sort of prophetic words, and he's got the group that he's part of and sort of running that focuses more on the prophetic element because it's necessary to have, you know, we can all prophesy, but God often selects maybe a handful to really kind of steward that ministry of, of prophecy, more the office of the prophet to bring the words to the church to weigh. And I feel like Ant and his, his group are part of that. And Ant just dropped me a message and said, oh, Merle said something about this, um, this wave and, and, and thing. And he said, oh, do you all remember that? Can you give us any help with that? And as soon as he said it, I thought, I absolutely remember it. Absolutely clear as a bell. I hadn't thought on it probably for years, but I thought, yeah. And as I started to tell him, I waited till I saw him in person because it would have been too difficult to try and message. And as I was saying it, I got excited about it again. It's like it was alive in a new way. It was so familiar to me from then, but it's like it had a new depth to it. And it's like it was, it was relevant again in a new way, the same words, but new. And I thought, 
that is just like God's word. And sometimes he can bring something back, a scripture, an image, a vision, and it's the same, but it's different. And he has a marvelous way of doing that. So I wanted to share that before I get into some scripture, because I want us to hold the whole context of the changing landscape, the seasons of life, and then this word. So God showed me a picture of like a city. If you imagine somewhere like New York, you know, you've got skyscrapers and it's just like a wall of skyscrapers. And you've got this sort of matrix of straight streets in between. Imagine that kind of city, that kind of landscape. And that, if you stand on the ground and look up, you feel very small. If you've ever been around big buildings, you feel very small and it's like, actually, I can't see around that building, around this building, and, you know, there you are. And God showed me a wave that was coming and the magnitude of it was like, a tsunami style wave, the kind of wave that doesn't just trickle in, the kind of wave that can just engulf entire areas. And those huge man made skyscrapers that we so often can marvel at our own magnificence can actually just be completely overshadowed and even washed away by a wave of that magnitude. That is the power in nature. So God showed me this wave coming, and this wave was going to just engulf everything. It was going to flood all of those streets, every street, all the land would be covered, and the wave was just going to wash over absolutely everything. That's bad news if you're stuck on the ground. If you're stuck on the ground, or even if you're on top of that building, wherever you are, if you see that coming... Yeah, if you've ever just watched any footage of, a, of like a big wave like that, that looks pretty terrifying just on a screen, let alone if you were standing there watching. But the purpose of this word isn't to terrify you to a place of hopelessness. It's to strike the awe of God and the power of God into us to receive an invitation that God is giving every single person to be able to prosper and be strengthened, not to be washed away by the wave, but to ride the wave and actually enjoy it because God has a surfboard for every single person. And if you've ever watched a surfer, they're just in one, they're just at one, they have something with a wave and it, it looks incredible. <laughs> it looks like a lot of effort goes into it. Like, but when you watch the pro surfers, there's just something. There's like a poetry to how they can read those waves, how they are on the board, how they move, they move with it. Like Paul said to us about the eagle tilts the wings depending on how the turbulence and the air pressure is. And it's how you maneuver depends on whether you soar and prosper or whether you go down and go under. And I felt like God said, I've got a surfboard for every single one of you. No exceptions. The surfboard's got every single person's name on. There's a specific one and it represents a specific calling he has for you. Everyone is unique. But the surfboard has to be taken. You have to just simply take it to yourself. And then I felt God say, I'm going to train you and teach you how to surf. How to use this board so that it becomes one part of you. That what I have for you is just like a hand fitting a glove perfectly. You will just... Become one with that board and then you will be on top of that wave. So when that wave comes, because it's coming, that wave will come, but it won't be a surprise to you. It won't be something you need to fear because you will have the board ready 
and you'll have the timing and you'll get on that board and you'll surf that wave. And no matter what happens with it, as long as you keep in touch with the one who's training you and the one who's teaching you and you keep fixed to that board, you will succeed. And there'll be something released, not just in this town, in this nation, but in this world, this planet, like we've never seen before. As the end time chapter hits, there's new things God wants to do with his church, essential things in this battle we face against darkness. And that is the difference. And the question is, will you take your surfboard? Because there's the warning that comes with it as well. And it sounds harsh, but it's actually a loving warning that comes from God. And he says, the wave will come. It won't be stopped for you if you don't pick up that board. But if you choose not to pick up that board and you keep turning away and you keep refusing to let me do what I want to do with you and you keep saying no, there'll come a time when you won't be ready. You won't have the board or maybe you've got it but you've not applied yourself to the teaching and the training you've thought, oh, I'll just sort of wing it on the day. It won't be like that. The wave will come, and if you've not allowed him to train you and teach you, the wave will simply wash you away. It'll push you to the sidelines, and you'll stand there watching the others surfing that wave, soaring like the eagle, wondering why it's not you. Because the end time scriptures talk about the love of many growing cold. Yep. And I think that's a serious, serious warning. That's talking about Christians. The love that's mentioned there is Christian love, agape love. The love that only the believer has when they become alive to God. And if it says the love of many, that's really serious. That's majority that's Jesus himself saying in that end times, the love of many will grow cold. And it lists a bunch of reasons why. But I see that as being one of them. If we've not recognized the season that God has us in, if we've not prepared our heart and let him rework the landscaping of our heart, then we may find ourselves mispositioned, not in the right place that he wants us, if we've not taken hold of that surfboard and given ourselves over to him to teach us and train us, then we won't be ready. But the wave is coming and there'll be the cutoff point when it's like, it's coming now. You'll be ready if you've allowed me to get you ready. And every single one of us must just really search ourselves for that. But I felt today that what I'm going to bring just from the scriptures here, which is very much about seasons, is God is saying, will you take hold of that surfboard? Because I've given you everything to succeed. You have my Holy Spirit living within you. Here's my son Jesus right next to me, praying and interceding for you all the time. And here I am with my mighty hand and outstretched arm. And just like a child who may fall off a bicycle, I'll pick you up. I'll encourage you along. I won't rebuke you harshly for making a mistake, for falling off, for getting it wrong. All I ask is that you give yourself to me and allow me as a loving father, a perfect father, to teach you and train you. Whatever failings your own fathers or parents may have, that's not present in God. I always feel to say that because I know personally the word father can be a difficult one. The word parent can be a difficult one. But God is father and his perfect love, and take it from me, 
He's never failed me. He's never once shut me out of his love or his plan. He's had to discipline me sometimes, but that's for my own good. And I'm thankful for that. Because our children don't always understand when we need to be a bit firmer with them, when we need to discipline them, or when we need to put a boundary in place. They don't know if they go beyond that, that it's dangerous or they're wandering off. So there's a trust involved. That's the simplicity of God saying, trust me. Merle just talked about surrender. Again, it's just all been paved. The way has been paved for this. I didn't tell the band what to play or what to say. I haven't told anyone what to say or do. I've literally just quieted myself before the Lord and come today trying to just be faithful in what he's given me to bring. That's all I do. That's, that's, that's what I do in my life. <laughs> Because he's never let me down, and I don't believe he ever will. I really don't. He, he, he's just faithful because he's faithful because he's faithful. And if you can step into that place with him, you'll start to see, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's not see that the Lord is good and taste, but it's a bit of a backwards one for us. We want to see all the details sometimes. And I would say just as a practical point, it just came to my mind then, do position yourself amongst Christians who have gone further down the way than you. If you're struggling with a bit of history of your own, get around other Christians who've gone through some more stuff. Get testimony from them. Because I, I tell you, if I hear testimony shared, I get so encouraged. And if I've not been through it, it encourages me. Or if I'm maybe at the start of a similar journey and I think, oh, that encourages me. So not just reading your word. Read your word, yes. But sometimes talking to, you know, your flesh and blood human friends, a person who's just saying, this is what I did. This is what I've done for years or decades. That encourages me. And now I'm building up a few years, actually, so I can start to sort of, you know... Pass, pass some things on to the next generation and the generation beyond that. But I still got a ton to learn from those who are running ahead. The baton keeps getting passed back down the generations. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He transcends time. He runs through it. He's outside of it. He's all over it. So that's a lot. But try and keep that in, in your heart today. Seasons, landscape changing of your heart and of your environment and your surfboard. The wave of God that is coming on this land and on this, this nation in particular, I think is very significant to God. This, this United Kingdom, our little island, you read how much has gone on here. Yep. The men and women God has raised up in this land of old. Just read some of the people, some of the revival testimonies, some of the, some of the things that have gone on. You'll just be encouraged beyond belief. And the circumstances that they've come out of. And so often it starts with just maybe a couple of people who start to pray, start to worship, start to just throw their entire lives on his altar. And then marvelous things happen because God sees that. It's, it's almost like a light bulb flashes in heaven and points to that place in the world. Some people are praying. Some people have got a desire. Just like Isaiah looked up and saw the Lord, then God could speak to him. He heard that conversation going on. Who shall we send? That's marvelous. I can't even, I can't even begin to, to comprehend that. The Trinity having the conversation. Who shall we send? Isaiah caught an ear of that because he positioned himself. He looked up above the problems, the circumstances, which were real. I'm not saying ignore I'm saying look above to see the solution because God will look for those with an ear inclined to him. 
<laughs> the scripture I want to take you into today is Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Solomon, King Solomon, David's son, at the end of his life, right near the end of his reign, having started so well, but really sadly ended quite badly with a kingdom in ruins. <laughs> so much of what his father David had established for him had, had just been lost and only a small remnant remained. And Solomon really was reflecting on seasons. And I want to read just the first eight verses, just in the context of seasons and what we've discussed. Solomon says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. You can take that down now, Ian, thank you. You know... Of all the wisdom of Solomon, I find it so poignant that here a man towards the end of his, his reign as king and his, his life is so aware of seasons. How much he saw David, his father, go through. The ups and downs, how much he, his king, has gone through. The extreme high times and then the really tragic low times and then to come to this point at the end of his reign but to reflect upon seasons and one thing that really strikes me is here we have the absolute contrast of seasons time to be born a time to die time to plant a time to pluck what has been planted you know so often it can be like a pendulum swing. And sometimes the seasons can be like that in our lives. And you know, sometimes we need to see where God is positioning us in a season. We might be in similar seasons to each other, but at very different ends of a season. A time to plant, God might be calling you to be sowing into people and planting things and starting to nurture the seeds or the new shoots. And if something's buried beneath the soil, you might not see much happening for a while. And there's something of a discipline with the Lord required in that to keep faithful and keep excited about that. Others, you might be the one who kind of swoops in at the end and just like takes the harvest. You might lead someone to salvation I've had the privilege of doing that. But I'm not the sole person responsible for that. First of all, it's God and his Holy Spirit. Like, we kind of should know that. But there will have been so many along the way. And everyone is just as important. If that person, that first ever person who maybe witnessed something to them, if they hadn't done that, that tiniest little seed planted... That whole season and journey, that harvest of salvation may not have happened. That's awesome. That's why it's so important for us to position ourselves because we might be the person to sow the first seed. Just as important as the person next and next and next 
and onwards. And I just wanted to really convey that thought of, of the contrasting seasons and where you are in it. And I felt like God said we also need to be sensitive how we look at each other and judge each other in different seasons. Because so often God might be doing things in a person that looks different than how we think he should be dealing with a person. You know, when I first came to that, I mean, there's still stuff God's working on that kind of never really ends in a way while we're here on this earth. But there's a whole bunch of stuff he was working on at the start because there was so much baggage, so much rubbish, so much filth to clean off. I mean, it was like where to start. <laughs> So for anyone looking on, it would be like, wow, we can write a massive list on this guy. We can, there's tons. I deal with that first and that first and that. But maybe God wants to look at something very different. And it's like, I see those glaring things, but actually I want to do something here. Because as I just show this person my love and my grace, and we just start our love relationship maybe those glaring things start to dissipate and disappear on their own. As we cultivate that relationship and go on that journey, we become aware ourselves of things, the conviction of, oh, that thing there, that needs sorting, or oh, that thing I was doing, that needs to change. And it isn't always a bad thing. It could be you've been in a season where everything was as God wanted it, but now God's saying, I've got a new door opening, I've got a new season. And if we fail to move out of the old season, we then missed the next thing God wants to do with us. And that's actually like a form of rebellion. You know, we might have been like, oh, this was so fruitful, but God's like, yes, it was. But now I've brought that to an end and maybe he's passing it on to somebody else and that's their place. Or maybe the thing finishes and it's done full stop because God's finished with that particular thing. And that can be a challenge because it might be something that was so fruitful and so good. But if we then try and stay in that, a good godly work has now become a dead work because we're in the wrong place. We might be then blocking someone coming in, so we're forcing someone else to stay in the wrong place, as well as being in the wrong place ourselves. It's really the magnitude of this is awesome. And I like to almost slightly terrify myself with this before the Lord, but then encourage myself that I don't have to be afraid of whether I'm in the right place, as long as I'm simply saying, Lord, put me where you want me. And honestly, being brave and courageous enough to say whatever that looks like. Because it may not look, seldom does it look like you really want it to a lot of the times. And it's in hindsight when you look back and go, ah, yes, I see why God put me there. I see why he put me in, you know, that place or with those people. Because it, it formed aspects of me. It strengthened my relationship. It got me to have a deeper understanding of the character and nature of God because this word of his, he wants you to take in to yourself, but then he needs it applied in life. That's how you get a testimony. So like Joshua, you can then build that pile of rocks as a memorial, as a testimony. Because verse five here says, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. An aunt actually brought a word in our men's group a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him if I could share it as part of this message, and I'll share this as I finish. He talked about the stones, and he saw them very much almost as like memories, as memorials, and that we have our stones gathered, and they're like our memories, which are good, and the things that God has done, and we hold those, and like Joshua, we build those memorials like he did by the river after they crossed, and then people in future could go back to them. 
and their parents and the elders would explain what those stones meant. They represented something. But nobody was called to live by that pile of stones. They didn't stay by the stones. The stones of memory and memorial represented a season and a work, but then they'd crossed that river and they were to then go on into the promised land. If you stayed by the stones, you wouldn't move into the land. It'd be all well and good of what God has done. You could sit there and reminisce and have happy feelings about what he's done. And that's right. Remember what he's done. Actually, remembering allows you to step into the unknown. Because you can think, hey, if he did those kind of things, and he was faithful and powerful and true, whatever's behind that fog that he's got, as I step forward bit by bit, the fog keeps clearing my Indiana Jones steps keep on appearing as I keep walking. That's what he's saying to us today. And Ant brought the word that there were some of us who were maybe holding on to the stones, camping by the memorial, when God's saying, now, I've called you to move on now. Just as Joshua and the children of Israel did into that promised land, it's like I've got the next season opening up for you. There's a door, there's a pathway, there's a bridge, however you want to envision it in your head. There's the new season opening, a new dawn is coming now. Those were good, remember it, yes, and tell people, and you can, you can pop back and have a visit, but you're not to live here you're not to stay here now otherwise you'll just stagnate you're to move on into that season I've got a new landscape to work I've prepared a way I want to prepare your heart and I want you to grab that surfboard and come into the new chapter with me so that is what I wanted to leave us with the concept of not living by the memorial. Praise God for it and allow him to take you on now into the next chapter. And so I felt like I just wanted to invite everyone just to close their eyes and just sort of quiet themselves before the Lord and just reflect upon everything that I hope the Holy Spirit has been just planting in you God is looking to rework the landscape. He's looking to transform our hearts. He's looking to show us new things, take us in new seasons, whether that's something completely different or whether it's the same kind of setting but new things within the same setting. God can do various things with you just I feel he's asking his children today to say, will you take up that surfboard that I'm presenting to you? It's right there. Imagine it right there in front of you, pristine on the shelf, on a stand with your name on it. And it's literally just a case of you reach your hands out and you take hold of it. You take hold of it to yourself and you allow him to take you on from the memorial stones into a new season where you'll gather new stones, new memories, and you'll start to build a new monument to his goodness and a testimony of what he hasn't yet done. He's already seen it done because he's outside of time. So he's saying, come on, start gathering new stones, take up that surfboard. And I just felt today, I think, hopefully we all have a general heart attitude to do that, but I felt there was specific people, either in this room or watching elsewhere, who he wants to say, you know I'm talking directly to you in a specific, specific way. And what he wants you to do is stand or put a hand up, make an acknowledgement that you know that's you today, because I want to pray for us all, but I want to pray specifically for you. If you feel that's you, 
I'd invite you to stand and <laughs> grab the surfboard, reach out, grab the surfboard, take it to yourself. Take just a moment here. There's a, there's a special thing going on. I think the whole day's been engineered to this. And however many times you fall off the board, there's a loving father who's just so delighted you even got on the board. And he'll get you back on the board. And then eventually, you'll just surf. And then you can encourage others to surf. They'll see you and go, oh, that's you. If you can surf, <laughs> I can surf. We are nothing special, but we are profoundly special in God, in Christ. So I will pray now, Lord, I thank you for this word. I pray I've delivered it faithfully according to your heart and your love. And I pray all these people now, all your precious children will know their deep worth in you. There's no place for fear or for shame, but that they would have courage to step on with you, that they would enjoy the memorial stones that they are walking away from, excited by the fact that they will pick up new stones, have new testimonies, and build new memorials for your goodness and your glory. And that for each and every one of us, whatever it looks like, we will keep getting on that board, that surfboard, being encouraged by your love, to just ride that wave wherever you take us for this massive harvest of souls that I believe is coming, that we, your church now, will be the light of this world in a time of darkness. We will prosper and thrive for your glory in the name of Jesus. God bless you all. Seal it to us today. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.